good morning to my church family. I hope you're having a wonderful Easter, and although we are not here together this morning in the sanctuary, I hope that this makes you feel a little bit more like you're in the sanctuary with us this morning. As we begin, uh, we want to, uh, of course, uh, recognize that this is a very special day for believers. This is Easter Sunday, the Sunday where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful day it is. And so as we get ready to begin, we want to begin as we always do. I know you're at home, but as I say, he is risen. Please say back, he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's what we're here to celebrate this morning. As we get ready to begin, I want to uh, read uh, an important psalm. We're trying to read a psalm each Sunday as our call to worship. Today we're going to read appropriately one of the psalms of ascent. These are the ones that they would often sing as they enter Jerusalem for the uh, festivals. And we've been talking about that this week as you, as you followed our day-to-day -day devotionals. We've seen as they enter Jerusalem for this great uh, festival of Passover. And it says in Psalm 123, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease with the contempt of the proud. Brothers and sisters, as we think about the cry for God to have mercy on us, we are also reminded of the cry uh, that we looked at earlier this week as Jesus entered in to Jerusalem. The cries of Hosanna, Lord save us. This is what this week is about. God's mercy upon his people, God's Savior coming and giving his life as an atonement for sin. And as we looked at those events on Good Friday and saw the great cost that was paid for our sin, we recognize that we come here this morning ready to celebrate. Because on this morning in history, as those dear ladies went to anoint the body of their Lord they found he was not there. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning to worship you, to give uh, praise to your holy name, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, as we gather to, to worship in the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, I pray you would move in our midst, even in this uh, time in which we are uh, not gathered together here in this sanctuary, but are spread out across this town and possibly even around the region. Father, bless this time. Let us remember how important this day is. Let us celebrate today that Christ is the living Savior, risen from the dead, defeated sin and death, and we come here today to lift high his holy and precious name. And it's in that name that we pray and gather and for his everlasting glory. Amen. Please join us as we sing Christ is risen, he is risen indeed.
song we'll be singing, Were You There? Oh, 
As we come to the time of our reading of the scripture for the morning message, we are found in Mark chapter 16, and as you've been uh, following along this week on our daily devotions as we walk through uh, the chapters of Holy Week in the Gospel of Mark, uh, you have followed the story of Jesus through these days, and it comes now to the day of resurrection. Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 1, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices and they, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said amongst themselves, who will roll the stone away from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went quickly out and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Before we move forward in our service, it's our time that we're going to begin looking at uh, our catechism for the week, and it comes from Uh, Spurgeon's Puritan Catechism that we've uh, been talking about, and I hope that you are reading and following along. We're going to start with the very first question. We spoke about it last week. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. Please join us as we sing before the throne of God above. Justice. Uh... 
the next song we'll be singing is Jesus Live, so please join us in singing. Well, good morning. Excited to uh, be up here to preach to you on this Easter Sunday morning, and I hope you are excited to gather as the people of God, even though we are not gathering in this same room. As we uh, celebrate this morning, we celebrate an important day. In fact, it's more than an important day. It's the day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the music this morning has moved in our hearts and prepared us uh, for the time of God's Word, and uh, I'm just excited to be here. I, we've been working hard as a church to uh, do the audio recordings and to get our video equipment so we could begin uh, to film these and put them online. So I'm thankful that we are able to do that for this Easter Sunday morning. As we begin uh, to have our time of God's Word today, I want us to remember that this is more than an important day. I said that a moment ago, but it's important to reiterate this is an essential day, not just an important day, it's an essential day. Without this day, there is no hope. 
It is important, no doubt. In fact, if Christ had not gone to the cross, there would be no hope. But if he had gone to the cross and remained in the grave, there would also be no hope. We know this because St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Why do some of you say there is no resurrection, he says. Do you not recognize that if Christ didn't rise, you will not rise? But if Christ arose, then all those in him will likewise rise. My friends, it's only because Christ conquered death and the grave. Sin and death were conquered that we have hope today that we will share in that victory over death, sin, and the grave. If you follow along this week as we've been doing our daily devotions through the Gospel of Mark on Sermon Audio, then I would ask you to reflect back to where we were Friday night. I mean, in our devotional time, you might have listened to it Friday morning, but It's kind of the end of the day, isn't it? It's almost the Jewish Sabbath and they have to get the body hurriedly put into the grave, into the tomb, and then roll the stone in front because it would have been inappropriate for such behavior to go on after the beginning of the Sabbath. And so you remember the speed with which Joseph of Arimathea was at work to try to get the body put in the tomb. But do you remember we ended that devotion with a reminder that the mood was not what we'd want it to stay? The disciples were not thinking, hey, it's just a short time until Christ will rise again. We say Sunday is coming. And we rejoice that Sunday is coming because it means our Lord will not stay in that tomb. But brothers and sisters... They weren't understanding that. They were without hope, it would seem. They were uh, just upset and heartbroken. Maybe you could just say they were broken. They were scattered. Peter denying Christ three times. He had said a little earlier that night, I would never, will never, I will stand with you. I will do whatever it takes. I will be by your side, Lord. Jesus said, this very night you'll deny me three times. And of course, our Lord was right. (laughs) No doubt about that. He was right. But think about the other disciples. They've scattered. And that's not to even mention the one who betrayed Christ. Brothers and sisters, when we leave the scene, if you will, Friday night, it does not look good. Everyone heartbroken. It would seem without hope. But we come today to this day that changed everything. Everything changed. Because on that Sunday morning, that first day of the week, that first Lord's Day, Christ arose victorious. I am so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for the hope that I have and you have in Christ Jesus because He arose. So that brings me to our text for today. It'll not surprise you since this whole week we've been in the Gospel of Mark that we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark today. We started, of course... Uh, looking at uh, Pass- uh, Passover, the uh, triumphant entry last Sunday morning, and we walked through day by day, didn't we? Uh, Christ coming back in on Monday and the cursing of the fig tree and the, the judging, if you will, of the temple as he cleared out the court of the Gentiles. Tuesday, a day of teaching. Wednesday, a day of rest and adoration. Thursday, the Lord's Supper as they celebrated Passover in Christ pointed out to them that all of these things pointed to him. And then, of course, across the Kidron Valley and ascending up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Christ prayed. Father, if it can be, let this cup pass 
but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That cup was the wrath of God. That's the Old Testament picture, the, the cup of God's wrath. And Jesus knew that it was necessary if he were to save his people for that cup to be poured out on him. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of understanding what he was going to have happen as that cup of wrath would be poured on him. And he would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My friends, as we read in Mark's gospel today, we're going to see that Jesus doesn't stay in that tomb. We're going to read... Uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, you can join right along with me. I can find where I've got it marked here. Here we go. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought, uh, bought spi uh, spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning... On the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said amongst themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were very afraid. Brothers and sisters, as we look at our text today, I want us to see three, three quick points this morning. Three quick points. First of all, missing the truth. Missing the truth. Second of all, fearing the truth. And lastly, vindicating the truth. I think we'll see all these points in our text today. Starting with the idea of missing the truth. Mark tells us that these women that we are reading about really missed an important truth, didn't they? They missed an important truth. It's an undeniable fact. They missed the promise of God in Christ that Christ would not stay in the grave. In this, these women did not err any more than anyone else did. They did not err more than the disciples did. They all missed what Christ was saying. They all failed to hear what he told them time and again. From the very beginning of his ministry, the purpose of his coming was declared. Over and over again it was declared. John said that he was the Lamb of God. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was speaking of his great sacrifice. But that sacrifice was not to be the end of the story. He told the leaders, tear down this temple and in three days I will build it again. They all missed it. The leaders didn't understand. They said he's threatening to tear down the temple. He's going to destroy this temple. The disciples didn't understand it. John tells us it was only later upon reflection after his resurrection, that they understood what he was really talking about, that he was talking about the temple of his own body. The women missed it in this story. They all missed it. They all missed it. They'd been with him for so long, and yet they did not hear the testimony again and again that if he went into the grave, he would rise again. It said in Matthew, right? Jesus said, just as Jonah went into the well for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man must also be in the heart of the earth. What did he mean? Did Jonah stay in the belly of the whale? 
Of course not. If they thought about what he said over and over again, they would recognize the truth. It became very clear to the early church, didn't it? As they thought about it and proclaimed it, they would recognize, wait a minute, in the prophecy that David gave that his body would not see corruption, oh yeah, David's body's still in the grave. He must have been speaking on behalf of another. And so my friends, we see over and over again that it was just missed. We don't have to wonder if these women missed it. We know they missed it. Mark tells us they missed it. How does he tell us? Well, they went that morning to anoint a dead body. They went that first Easter morning to find a tomb and to anoint a dead body. Now that is no small act of devotion. I don't want to dismiss what they're doing. It's a great act of devotion to want to go and show love to someone by anointing their body for burial. My friends, on the third day, it might not even be pleasant to do so. And yet these women were willing to do this because they loved Jesus so much. So there's great love and commitment here. I don't want to downplay that. There is great love and commitment here. These women are exceptional. They love Jesus. He loved them. They were devoted to Him. They've come to honor Him. But my friends, they've also come to accept too small a picture of who Jesus is. Too small a picture of who Jesus is. The Jesus that they came to anoint would have been held by death. Would have been held by the grave. But they came to understand that the Jesus that they would fully know soon, if you will, at least from the perspective of His resurrection, they would see this fuller picture of Him. This is one that the grave could never hold. Christ could not be held by sin, death, or the grave. Again, we can read the various resurrection accounts of the disciples, but we see the same reaction across the board. They've all been slow to understand what they were taught. The one that they follow was the great conqueror of the grave. He himself is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. They've missed the important truth of what God was doing, and yet by God's amazing grace, they begin to see it. So we see this idea of missing the truth. I also want us to see the idea of fearing the truth, because we see that as well in the text today, this Easter morning. In discovering that the tomb was empty, these women encounter glory. Glory so amazing, glory so profound that it frightens them. Now partly I say because they recognize that Christ has risen victorious over the grave. But even beyond that, even in the immediate moment, they see the appearance of an angel. God does not leave the tomb empty without an explanation. There is an angel there. And what does he answer them? He tells them, this Jesus that you're seeking, he's alive. He's risen. He is not here. Now, my friends, they were expecting to take care of a dead body. But now they hear that he's alive. That he's risen from the dead. Can you imagine for a moment? These women you would think would be dancing if this were a, a created story, a Hollywood story, some kind of fairy tale. These women would be celebrating. They'd say, I knew it. Yay, Jesus is alive. They're terrified. Verse 5 says that they, they are experiencing exomveo, this idea of alarm, amazement, excitement, all kind of combined in one. But it's not a, just a joyous excitement. It's an alarmed excitement. They are scared. Verse 8 says that they go out quickly. Oh, to tell others, right? That's what they were going to do. No, it says they told no one. They told no one. Why? Because they were tromos. They trembled and were greatly afraid. Phobeo, they were terrified by what they'd experienced. Again, this is the normal reaction of anyone who encounters an angel. You may see on Oprah that 
People talk about, oh, it was such a, a, a warm, fuzzy feeling when I encountered an angel. That's never what happens in the Bible. There's a reason angels generally have to begin with, be not afraid. Because people are scared to death to encounter any measure of holiness. Now, my friends, this is an interesting moment. This moment is the centerpiece of all human history, all history, period. And these women are in the presence of a glorious work of God, a glorious work, a triumphant work of God, a demonstration of the power of God. Paul says in Romans that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the very power of God. The gospel is the explanation of how things that are dead become alive. For we were lost in our trespasses and sin. But the gospel grants life through what Christ has done on the cross and what occurred when he arose from the dead as God makes us new by faith, by His grace, in Christ alone. My friends, these women are terrified. In fact, the text tells us it might seem to be a little bit uncomfortable to us that uh, they are ordered to go tell the disciples, or you know, and Peter particularly, and it says they went and told no one, and there's much debate over this, isn't there, on how, they, how this is to be interpreted. I kind of like uh, some of the people who argue that it may mean that they didn't tell anyone on the way. That they were terrified. They were trying to get out of that tomb as quickly as they could. And they ran straight to the disciples. They said a word to no one else. Very well could mean that. Or it may mean they were so terrified they went home for a time before going to tell the disciples. I know this, that God's word is true. My friends, what we want to see this morning as we're looking at this is that this gospel story really began here, didn't it? I mean, the, the biblical theological story of God's redemption is throughout the entirety of the scriptures, but this is an important moment. As I said a moment ago, all of the Old Testament points to this. If Christ did not rise, it was all in vain, all in vain. Just as if Christ had not died on the cross, it was all in vain. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 that if salvation could have come through the law, then Christ's death itself was vain. In vain, excuse me. So we see over and over again uh, the necessity of this moment. And yet all the glory and revelation in this moment produces fear and shock in these women. It's the same fear that Isaiah felt in chapter 6 of his great book of prophecy as he encountered the Lord. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And around him were angels with six wings. And my friends, what does he say? Woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm of among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King of glory. We recognize these women recognized that they were fearful. They had encountered something of glory, something of God's power, God's working. Maybe not quite as amazing as what Isaiah had seen at that moment, but in another sense, just as amazing because although they didn't see the risen Christ, they heard about the risen Christ. And I guarantee you Isaiah would have loved to have been there for that. I guarantee you Isaiah would have loved to have been at that empty tomb that morning, as many of us would have loved to have had the excitement of going and seeing that stone rolled away and seeing that the grave could not keep Christ, could not hold Him, had no hold at all upon Him. But if we've seen those points, missing the truth, fearing the truth, we also want to see the vindication of the truth, that God is vindicating the truth. The glorious resurrection would go on to be essential to the church. We see that, don't we? 2,000 years later, 
Here we are on a Sunday morning and we're still declaring the same truth. Christ arose to the glory of God. The apostles proclaimed this continually. The tomb was empty. They suffered. They died because they would not recant that testimony. The grave was empty. We've seen him for ourselves. We have walked and talked with the risen Christ. They claimed it was more than just a literal fact. They said it's also a theological statement. Jesus was telling the truth in everything that he said. He is the Lord of life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is all these things. That's what Peter says, isn't it? Peter says that this act vindicated Jesus. You could turn to the Pentecost sermon, if you would, in Acts chapter 2. And you'll see the argument that Peter makes there. I always love to, uh, to think about this. As we look at it, we'll look at verses 22 through 24. Men of Israel, Peter says, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Brothers and sisters, there ought to be a hallelujah shouted there. Think about what all is said here. So many things. This is a man, the God-man, Christ, fully God and fully man, attested to you by God, by all the signs and wonders that he did. We know that's true. Nicodemus comes and says, we, are no, we know that you're a, a teacher sent from God. How else could anyone do the things that you do? He was attested by miracles, wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst, Peter says. You cannot say you didn't know, you didn't see, you saw, you knew, you heard. But understand this, this didn't happen by chance. What happened in the days of Christ did not happen by chance. Him, meaning Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. This all happened according to the determined purpose. No way, that's not going to happen, right? Determined purpose of God. And by God's foreknowledge, all these things happened. You have taken him by lawless hands. You crucified him and you put him to death. What's Peter saying? That's your verdict. That's the verdict that you delivered against Jesus. You said he's guilty. We looked at this, didn't we? In our journey through this week, the Sanhedrin said he's guilty of blasphemy. We don't need witnesses. He openly admits it. He says that he is the son of man. He has made reference to this messianic claim from the Old Testament. Before Caesar, they change it, don't they? Excuse me, before Pilate before Caesar's representative. Before the Roman magistrate, they changed the charge. It's no longer blasphemy. They wouldn't have cared about that. It's treason. He calls himself king of the Jews. And we know there is no king but Caesar. In fact, remarkably, the crowd will say this, won't they? The crowd says, when he says, what shall I do with the king of the Jews? They say, we have no king but Caesar. Amazing. But my friends, all these things happen not by chance. Yes, they happen by the, the wicked desires of the people. Of course they do. The people's sin is their own sin. They do this by their own, of their own accord. But it also says it happens according to the perfect foreknowledge of God. His absolute determination involved in this. His purpose involved in this. They have taken Christ and they've killed him. That's your verdict. You found him guilty. But there's a higher court. There's a higher court. And that higher court is the court of Almighty God. And God took your, your verdict and he threw it out. And how did he do that? He vindicated Christ. 
That's what he says in verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. If we were to turn to chapter 4, you're going to see a very similar thing. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you have crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. How do you account for the miracle? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer. You know, Jesus Christ, the one you delivered your verdict on when you crucified him, but the one God vindicated. The one God took that verdict and threw it aside, overturned it, overruled it, because it was not possible for death to hold him. Yes, Jesus died on that cross because of sin, but it wasn't his sin, was it? He died for sin that was imputed to him. He died for my sin and your sin if you are in him. I mentioned, I believe it was Friday in our devotions, that Rembrandt, when he painted the crucifixion, painted himself as one who was putting Christ upon the cross. Why? Because he recognized that it was his sin. If he put his faith in Christ, it was his sin that Christ was dying for. It wasn't Christ's sin. It was our sin. So my friends, again, you found him to be a liar, an inconvenience, a threat to your religious system. You found him guilty or worthy of death and you conspired to declare him guilty. And it was a conspiracy. We looked at that as well. But your verdict was overturned. Your verdict was overturned by God who declared that Jesus is just and exactly who he said he was. He's Lord of all. In raising him from the dead, all of his claims are vindicated. No deceit in them. He's the Messiah, the risen Savior, the glorious Lord. In Him is found the way of reconciliation unto God. In Him and only in Him is found that way of reconcile, reconciliation unto God. In Him and Him alone is found the way of life. I want to close this morning by saying that the message of the apostles is a message we still proclaim today. You know, uh, one of the truths is we preach a pretty unoriginal message here at North John City Baptist Church. Uh, we preach the same message that's been preached for 2,000 years. When we miss doing that, when any church misses doing that, then my friends, they need to make sure they haven't fallen outside the truth. We preach the same message proclaimed by the apostles. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And Easter shows that the grave and death were defeated and that all those in Christ likewise shall rise to new and eternal life with him to the glory of Almighty God. That's the message we proclaim today for Easter, yes. But it's also the message we proclaim every day, every Sunday, every Lord's Day. We proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we like sheep have gone astray, that in our sin we have become a fallen people separated from a holy God, and that Jesus Christ alone is the remedy. And that those who by faith cry out unto Him, realizing that they have a need that they cannot meet themselves, those that recognize their need of someone to atone for their sin because they cannot for themselves. Those people who cry out unto Christ are delivered by Him, not by works, not by human effort, but by the grace of Almighty God. That they have a need that can only be met by God's grace in the person and work of His Son, who took our sins upon himself and went to Calvary's cross. I feel like I'm saying much I said throughout the week. But that's the reason it says in the scriptures that he became obedient to death, 
even the death of the cross, even this death of, of suffering and shame, even this death on the tree, when it's recorded in the Old Testament that cursed is anyone who dies upon a tree. My friends, it's only in Christ. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 4 that if it is a gracious gift of God, then it is a gift. It's not something you can earn or purchase. Because to him who works, the wages are counted as not as grace, but as debt. Think about that for a minute. If you can earn it, it's not grace. It is a wage. It is a wage. And yet we are told again and again in the Scriptures that it is by grace that we are saved. It is a gift, not something we have earned. We have not earned salvation. We stand in grace in Christ because we stand in Christ's righteousness imputed to us just as our sin was imputed to Him. My righteousness is filthy rags to our holy and righteous God. But by grace I have died and now my life is hidden with Christ in God. Now that is a gift to proclaim on this Easter Sunday morning. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. He defeated death and hell. And all those who put their faith in Him by God's grace shall rise too. What a glorious truth. An awe-inspiring truth. What an awesome gift we've received. So with awe and reverence and joy unimaginable, let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day and every day for the gift of life that we have in Christ Jesus by your grace. And Father, today as we think about what Christ did to pay that debt, if you will, to pay that uh, wage that we deserve by going to the cross, taking our sin, having it imputed to Him, though He Himself was sinless. Father, I pray that we would think about the love of Christ wherein He did that for us. Father, I just pray today that as we celebrate, we wouldn't picture Jesus still in that grave, for He is not. We would recognize that uh, we have reason to celebrate today because that stone was rolled away and that tomb was empty and Christ has risen he is risen indeed according to the plan that you had made before time began, before the foundation of the world. Father, we have reason to be thankful today. Father, we ask today that we would count our blessings, that we would recognize the gifts that we've been given, that we would be thankful that we would love Christ. Father, help us to do that. Help us to recognize the position that we have in Christ by grace. We pray that we would especially feel that this Easter morning as we celebrate our risen King. It's in His name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the truths as we close this morning that I want to mention is, first of all, I'm thankful that you're here with us this morning. I know it's a little strange being in the sanctuary and looking out here and there's no one here. And I cannot wait for the day where we can gather back in the Lord's house as the Lord's people and worship together. But brothers and sisters, know that I'm missing you. I know you're missing each other and I appreciate that we're all staying in contact. Pray for one another. Remember, especially those that have Family members, uh, we have a couple in our church that have family members uh, out of state that are uh, either dealing with COVID-19 or have someone very near them dealing with COVID-19. Please be praying for them. And my friends, be praying for your church. Be praying for all of our churches in this community and around the world who are faithful in Jesus Christ. And as we get ready to close today, I want to close with a benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above 
all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a happy Easter.